Hello everyone and uh, welcome to History Fest. Welcome back to some of you whose names I recognise. Um, you probably won't recognise my face, but you may recognise my voice from earlier on today, is the dislocated voice in the background. Uh, but I'm Sarah Jones and I uh, work with the history team on the recruitment and admissions side. Um, I'll just run through the general housekeeping again. Um, hopefully you can all hear me and see me. Um, if you have any issues with either of those two things, please do put a note in the chat and I might be able to help you resolve those. Um, obviously your videos are turned off and also your microphone, but please do feel free to use the chat. Um, and this session that we're running today is a really great engaging session, uh, getting down and dirty with the documents with Dr. Sean Lang. And so with no further ado, I will hand over to Sean. Hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello everyone. Now, normally if we were running this, um, you know, face to face in, in, a, in a lecture theatre or a classroom or whatever. Um, this would be a very interactive session and, you know, I'd be involving you with uh, with questions and points and taking your, your thoughts and views and what have you as we go along. Um, obviously, in this setup, we'll need to use the chat uh, function, but please do use it um, because, as you'll see, there are a number of issues that uh, uh, that I'll be asking you about uh, in terms of using documents. However, when I say getting down and dirty with the documents, um, I could, of course, have used the word sources because uh, a document is a form of source. Um, but I am very well aware of what sources mean when you are doing A-levels, because sources mean things like this. Um, and if you sort of groan and think, um, you know, hell, I've seen something like that. Sure enough, that's how sources look when you are in an exam room and the exam boards have taken source material and they well if you look at it what they've done is first of all to chop the sources up because if you look at those particular ones and i chose these at random i just sort of googled uh, for source papers and, and this was one of the ones that came up and it all fitted onto one screen so i went for that one um you see the first one labeled of course source a uh, it says new orleans daily crescent 13th of november 1860 well you know that's clearly um a newspaper account. Uh, I have no idea if that's the whole of it. I doubt it though. It doesn't look long enough. The second one, um, Alexander Stevens's letter to an unknown correspondent. It's only what nearly four lines, just under four lines long. Uh, it's hard to believe that a letter would be um, that short. So, um, so essentially what you're looking at are sources which have been cut down for the purposes of the exam paper. And What's happened to them? First of all, of course, and this might seem an obvious thing to, to say, but it's, it's worth thinking through. They've all been put so they all look the same. They don't look <clears throat> any different. They've got the same typeface. They've got they're all labeled source A, source B, source C. And the bit in, in italics underneath is something to, to sort of tell you what it is. Now, obviously, you know all this. But the point is, this is not how sources are in reality. I know they are for your reality with A-levels to, to, um, to pass, but in, re but in the real world, sources don't look anything like that. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is take you through uh, an example um, of a depository of, so of, of source material of all sorts, but particularly of written source material. <clears throat> And it's one which is available online, um, as many more archives are nowadays. Now, originally, ha again, had we been meeting face to face uh, on campus, I would simply have gone online and uh, we could have gone into a computer room and you could all have had access to it um, through our university subscription. But um, I, there are too many things that could go wrong in a situation like this. So what I've done has been to uh, take the various bits and pieces that I want and put them onto a PowerPoint. But in reality, what you can do is to go back and uh, and go online and there are various archives where you can do this i've simply chosen one which i happen to know well because I, I do various bits of work with it and the archive is the churchill archive it's um a complete collection of uh, the great majority of winston churchill's papers it's also got a very very large number of other collections of papers uh, in there as well it's all very well me saying it's a collection of papers what that actually look like. So I'm just going to show you some images of the Churchill Archive in reality so you have an idea of what it is we're talking about. That's the 
building it's in. It's in Cambridge, actually inside one of the colleges in Cambridge called Churchill College. It's a college that was built in the 1960s, as you can tell from this inspiring architecture, um, and named after Sir Winston Churchill. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with architectural styles, but if you are, this is a very, very typical of uh, American um, architecture, again, of the sort of 1960s, uh, 1960s, 1970s. The American Embassy in London at the time um, looked very like this. And it's no great surprise, uh, no great um, coincidence, because a lot of American money went into the creation of the Archive Centre. That's uh, a significant point, which, which we, might, we might come back to. So what is an archive? Um, when we talk about sources, they don't exist on exam papers. They exist in things like this. Um, this is a rather wonderful photograph of an archive. Um, where are the papers? This, you'll see it's very different from a library. You will, I've no doubt, be familiar with libraries because you know, you'll have one at school, you've got public libraries and you may have used, uh, you may have gone into other ones. Obviously a library is a collection of books. You see the books on the shelves and there may be books which are uh, behind the scenes uh, in what are called the stacks if it's a very big library. But basically, you know, you know what a book is. Um, but here you see you've got uh, all these boxes. Um, the boxes themselves are often created specifically for archives um, and very often using acid free card in order to avoid deterioration of documents inside them. And when you open these boxes up and they come in many different shapes and sizes because often they're actually designed specifically for the, uh, the object. So down here, for example, you have an actual book in an archive box and that would be because the book itself is old and precious and although that one looks in fairly good nick but quite often books which are put into archive boxes are themselves sort of falling apart so you need the box in order to to keep everything there uh, this one you can see has got um the sort of ring binder thing so presumably it's to store um uh, papers which have, which have been um, hole punched in that way and up here top left you can see these documents which have been folded into that sort of rather long shape this is very very typical for um sort of official uh, correspondence i'm talking about sort of civil service reports and uh, and memos you won't know what a memo is necessarily because it's not a word that you need to use but basically it's this sort of pre-email email idea and they are very often folded in that way um, and you can see that they're in these boxes they've been bound with uh, with tape originally they were bound with red tape which is where the term red tape comes from but this is archival white tape and put inside the box and it won't just necessarily be uh, written documents or books like this over here you can see um, there's a rather lovely picture stored inside that archive box so that's what an archive you know <laughs> forgive me, but a real archive looks like. But it's very easy to get the idea, if I sort of go back to that picture of the stacks for a moment, that everything is in there. What you have to bear in mind is, how did it get there? Um, how does someone's letter or that book or that picture, or whatever it might be, end up in one of these boxes? Um, is there some sort of uh, official collecting policy or, you know, so that when, when I, you know, at what point do you move something out of your filing cabinet, as it were, and put it in one of these archives? And it's very easy to assume that it's all sort of done automatically and this is all official, but actually it's not like that at all. An archive basically only has what people have thought to give it. It is as simple as that, quite literally. There's no official rule about, about the sort of thing, not even actually for state papers. Um, uh, and, you know, you, something will find its way into an archive if someone at some point thought to put it there. And then who puts them into these boxes? Who, what, who decides that it goes into one box rather than another? That's the sort of thing that archivists do. But all the way along, what I'm saying is that material gets into archives by a process which is not automatic and can sometimes be um, a bit accidental or random. Um, sometimes mistakes can be made and you can find, you know, for example, you pick up one letter and you don't notice that there's another letter sort of folded in with it. And so that's how we talk about things being found in the archives after many, you know, many years later, because at some point they went in with no one realising that it was there or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. There's always an element of the random when it comes to um, to the you know what actually goes into archives but then in the case of churchill's um papers because that's where they're they're housed now i mentioned that Ch the churchill archivist in churchill college cambridge 
but Churchill himself never lived in Cambridge. Um, he, uh, for much, certainly the sort of second part of his, his life, he lived at this place, um, Chartwell uh, in Kent. And if you just, you can visit it, it's a National Trust home now. Um, here's um, rather, um, is a rather wonderful picture of Churchill at work. He was one of those who quite liked working and standing up. Um, it's something that they're beginning to, to bring back actually because it's, it's good for your back. Um, but it was very much Victorian practice to work at a standing up desk rather than always sitting down. Um, there he is a, a, at work, uh, there he is with his papers. Now there they are with him on his desk. Okay, he's sitting down there. Um, at some point and in some way that paper went from being there into being in a box in a sort of cellar under a college in Cambridge. And that's the case with any archival material that you look at. And what you have to do therefore is sort of take it, what you've got in front of you from, I'll go back to the pictures, from this, this sort of highly stylized presentation for an exam board, cut down, put into one form of typeface, given a label and all the rest of it, back through this and the, you know where the examiner or whoever sort of found it and then started doing all that with it all the way back to this to the person who originally wrote it so when you have a source in front of you you have somehow to picture the way it was originally created if it's typed try to picture the person sitting at a typewriter typing it away who was it in what circumstances? If it's handwritten, try to picture the person taking a piece of notepaper down, picking up the pen, sitting at their table, sitting at their dining room table or their study desk, or whatever it might be. Um, now, when you've got the real sources in front of you, like those, it's a bit easier to do because you can actually see the handwriting. You can see the, uh, um, the watercolor painting. It's harder for you when you've got it on an exam paper to try to do that. But nevertheless, that is what you have to do. So if I can just nip back quickly to that exam paper that we had at the beginning. And the Daily Crescent, uh, it's okay, I don't know anything particularly about this exam paper, as I say, I picked it at random. But a news report, you've got to think, um, you've got to sort of picture the reporter. Uh, you've got to picture the reporter sitting down writing this. Where did he get his information from? Who has he spoken to? And, and so on. What you have to do is try to picture the original creation of the source you're working with, if you see what I mean. Now, to illustrate this, what we're going to do now is get down and dirty with the documents. We're going to look at some examples which I've taken from the Churchill website um, to give you an idea. So let's start with this. The first and most important question you ask of a source. Now, okay, that's a question for you. Um, so could you just go onto the chat? And there's my first question. Um, what is, as, you've un as you understand it, the first and sort of most important question that you need to ask of a, histor of a historical source? Don't worry about sort of thinking, oh no, will I get it wrong, anything like that. I just want to know what, as you understand it, is, th is the important thing to ask. So I'm going to stop talking a second and see if anyone is able to put something on the chat. Is that awful silence as you think? Is this going to work? While you're typing, ah, right, what's the purpose of the source? What's the author's intention? That's from Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Extremely good question. What's the provenance? Where did it come from? Um, again, from Sophie. These are all good questions. Um, there's certain questions that you ask, but they're not actually the first question. The first question is not necessarily something that you consciously ask. It's something that your brain is doing even as you look at it. And so we can do it with these uh, things here. And it's a very simple question. And because it's so simple, it is actually the single most important. What is it? What is this? When I moved on to this slide, that's what your brain will have been doing. You'll have seen, oh, he's changed the slide. Hello, what have we got here? And when you fully answer that question, many of these, que these other questions that you asked will begin to um, fall into place. You'll begin to get answers to them. You might not get everything, but you'll certainly get quite a lot of it. So in this case, what, what is it? Well, visually, you can see it's handwritten. 
immediately. All right. Secondly, we look at it. Um, what you know, it's all very well saying it's handwritten. Well, if you sort of look at its two sides or two two pages, I don't know offhand if one is the back of the other or if these are two separate sheets of paper and there's no way of telling from this but incidentally if you do get into an archive one of the most important things to do is or here's a tip always look on the back you've got the main thing just check on the back it may be empty but you you'd be surprised how often you find something scribbled or something on the back which is also useful we can't do that here Okay, um, we noticed that it says yours faithfully, was it Miss um, Ackhurst or Akehurst? Akehurst, I would imagine, um, there. Uh, and if we look at the beginning of the first page, 27 of the 9th, 1938, the Right Honourable Winston Churchill, sir, it's a letter. Okay, so it's, <clears throat> I know you might think well, that's obvious, but there are many, many different types of letters. A typed letter with sort of headed note paper, is one type of letter but this is not this is handwritten so immediately can you see what I, you know when you talk about what's the purpose of the source and what have you um a type letter on headed paper will normally have one sort of purpose but a handwritten letter to the right honorable winston churchill mp to an mp it's probably going to be some sort of constituent and we look at the address um and uh, the address is oh, hang on, i'm going to the wrong thing the address is in Essex, and here I can tell you something sort of quite easy, which is that um, Winston Churchill's constituency was in Essex, and uh, I'm sure this is from a con and our date is uh, the 27th of of um, the 9th, uh, so September 1938. So we've got a constituent writing to Churchill in September 1938. Now this is where you use a bit of your historical knowledge uh september 38 isn't that the time of the munich crisis the big crisis over czechoslovakia and hitler wanting the sudetenland if you i mean okay it's my job yes i, I know it is but you could do a quick check you know you can, this is where you can google something if you want you know or just a quick check of uh, uh, of a history book and just say that is when it was yes it is so what we have is a constituent writing to churchill right when the Munich crisis is happening. 27th of uh, September is exactly when it's all, all, all kicking off. Okay, now the handwriting luckily is not too difficult to read. Some handwriting, believe you me, really is difficult, but this isn't too bad. So I'll read it out to you so you can hear what this uh, lady is saying. We know it's a lady because uh, she's told us Miss. Um, if you're thinking that's uh, um, not a way you might sign off yourself, this is where the difference in time comes in. There are different habits, different ways of doing things at different periods. So after time, you get used to it. The Right Honourable Winston Churchill. Um, Sir, in the serious position in which as a nation we find ourselves, my sister and I, as two of your constituents, beg of you to ponder our contentions. So it's two ladies, in fact, although it's signed by one, they're sisters, they're writing. Uh, and, you know, you said, what's the purpose of the source? What, why do you write to your MP? not about something you know that is a problem you've got yourself but about something which is in the world immediately think when have you written to an mp have you ever you know have you ever thought of writing to an mp of course nowadays you'd email is it not immediately a sign that this is something which really matters to them this is the the very fact that they've written is a sign of how uh, important an issue how importantly they're taking it so in the first place War in support of Czechoslovakia cannot really help any of the people there. We saw in the Great War what fighting on one's territory meant. The Great War was, of course, the term usually used for what we call the First World War, though we still do hear the term Great War. But of course, at the time, there hadn't been a Second World War in 1938, so they still called it the Great War. Um, far better avoid war, and to this end, we suggest offering up some national or imperial interests. The German folk hunger for a, and at this point I just need to um, move the um, these things around because it's actually hiding. Oh, yeah. um, hunger for a comfortable place in the world. And we who have seen their sufferings and repressions during post-war years must admit that they have a genuine grievance. We believe our plain duty as a, and then it's got 
it looks like extient nation. That's a standard short term, uh, a cross like that, like, looking like an X, is a standard short term, short pan term, sorry, for Christ. So Christian nation, as in Xmas, you know, for Christmas, um, is to join with the, with the uh, Czechs in giving to the point of great economic sacrifice. May we beg of you to consider all the facets of political and economic justice and truth and consider them again and again. So we believe you will be able to supply the needed, needed solution. Many thanks for your consideration of this letter. Yours faithfully, Miss M. Akehurst. So in answer to the questions that you raised, it's a letter to a constituent, uh, sorry, from two constituents to their constituency MP. That tells us immediately that this is something of great concern to them, that it's not just something in the news, uh, it's really touched a chord. Most things in the news pass most people by. Here's an example of one in the news that didn't pass these people by. Okay. Um, what's, their in, what's their purpose? What's their intention? What do they want him to do? Well, we can get that from the content um, of the source. Um, what they want above all what do you tell me actually what do you think from what they've said here is the main thing that these two ladies want to happen not necessarily churchill to do but what do they want finally to happen or if you like not to happen okay i'll pause again just give you a chance to uh, uh, to put your thoughts down They clearly feel strongly enough to write. They want some, okay, they don't want the nation to go to war at all costs. And uh, at, at, in other words, at all costs, they want the nation not to go to war. And he said, solve the crisis through a route that benefits all, including the Germans. Yes, uh, absolutely, Lucy, yeah, that's from you. And, we ha and, and they do give an idea of why they think this. It's nothing to do with not liking checks, and certainly they, um, but there are two things really, they refer back to the past, don't they? They refer to the Great War and they refer to um, the treatment of Germany after the, after the war. So in other words, they're looking back to the war and the Treaty of Versailles and they're saying, you know, we don't want another, you know, another war like that. The Germans were pretty badly treated anyway. Um, we must all try to maintain, maintain uh, peace. And then there's that mention of a Christian nation. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, and it's a, first of all, it's a reminder of how easily in, people could bring religion into their discourse. They, there was no sort of holding back or feeling that it wasn't part of, of politics, the sort of worries we have nowadays, nothing like that. We're quite open about it. In, and it says, we believe our plain duty as a Christian nation is to join with the Czechs in, in giving. Um, and what do you have to ask yourself with a source? You, you get an idea now. What, what have we got evidence of? We've got evidence of the two ladies called um, Miss M. Akehurst, and we don't know the name of her sister because she hasn't told us. We know what they think. And you could say, so what? Are these two ladies famous? No. Nope. Do we know anything else about them? As far as I know, not, unless, unless they have a family, doing, doing, some, doing some family history. So the question is, why is it in the Churchill archive? You see, at some point, um, this letter will have arrived on Churchill's desk. He uh, no doubt answered it because that's part of the job of, a, of, um, uh, of an MP. So where's his answer? Why haven't we got it? Because we haven't. Well, if you think about it, where would his answer have gone? Uh, if, particularly if he hand wrote it, which he very likely did, he'd have popped it in the post, it would have gone to their address, and that's where it will be. It will be in their papers, not in the Churchill archive. And that's always the problem with letters, that very often you'll get one side of the correspondence, but unless people are keeping a copy, and usually um, that was easier to do with typing because you had what's called carbon paper, which could produce, a, uh, uh, which could reproduce um, what you're, you're writing. Um, but if you haven't got that, then you have only got the letter that came in. You haven't got the reply. So we don't know uh, particularly what Churchill said. We can have a guess. So why do we, it's okay, all right, so it's, that's why it's in his papers. Why does it go into the archive? Well, it might be you just put everything into the archive. And I think actually that's an important part of the answer. But if you say, 
and of course you'll know this sort of question how useful is this what's the point is this telling us anything other than that these two ladies happen to think that it would be a good idea to make peace at any point and this is the next thing that a historian does with a source and that you need to consider and this most most definitely think of for your, for a level thinking is is this in any way typical are miss and miss or i don't know if the other one's um, married or not but are the Akehurst sisters typical of anyone other than themselves if they are completely off the wall if they are two sort of um figures and they are completely alone in their views then they are you know their letter is is interesting but no more than that it's not evidence of anything other than their particular personal views but if we think that actually they are simply putting into words on paper things that many many people thought then immediately this becomes very useful as evidence of something wider now how do we know if they're typical or not and you can't tell from the letter this is where you have to put a source into a wider context and you'd have to know more about uh, other things that people were writing either to churchill or to other mps um, to see are they uh, you know is this a very good sense of what most people thought well let's have a look at uh, another um letter that also went to church at about the same sort of time woodford was it was his uh, constituency much shorter this one by a chap um, his signature at the bottom sydney lambert um don't want don't worry about the handwriting as i say if you think uh, i don't know if you think this is bad or not i have had to read queen victoria's handwriting and i would not wish that on my worst enemy anyway here we are the right honorable winston s churchill dear sir for goodness sake cannot something be done to stop this persistent humiliation we are um all uh oops gosh can't read, um relying on you or upon you sorry to play uh, to place us english um uh gosh what's that um, among honorable peoples um who stand by their pledges for heaven's sake use your great strength and ability to save english prestige and honor no one else it seems will there's just one word i couldn't quite get in that one there uh, to place us English back among honourable peoples. Now, first thing that strikes you, I'd have thought, is the tone. The previous one was terribly so respectful, you know, hope you don't mind with us taking up your valuable time, that sort of thing. This one, it, it goes in immediately, for goodness sake, cannot something be done? You know, that's what's known as a rhetorical question. Um, and uh, so what do we lead, uh, read from this? How does Sidney uh, Lambert sound in terms of his mood? or if you like his uh, gen you know, the general sense of this letter. Again, I'll just pause for a moment. What word comes to your mind in terms of his frame of mind or his state of mind? Yeah, absolutely. He's angry, he's outraged, he's fr frustration above all. I think that's, uh, that's absolutely right. He's very, you know, for heaven's sake, can't anything be done? And he thinks no one is doing anything to save England from humiliation. Now, what does he mean by humiliation? Um, well, I think we can work out from this. Well, no, I, I, I don't know how well you know the, um, the history here, but basically the humiliation would be giving in to Hitler. In other words, the honourable thing would be to stand up to Hitler, to stand by the Czechs, to resist Hitler, not let him take any Czech territory. But no one is saying this. The only person who is, is Churchill. And so, uh, as Mr. Lambert writes to Churchill, and again, you go back to your questions, what is his purpose? His purpose is to strengthen Churchill's resolve so that he, he carries on. And why would you write a letter to someone to encourage them to do what clearly they want to do anyway? What's the point of writing a letter to someone to say, basically, uh, stand up to Hitler, even though you know that he wants to? Again, I'll just pause. What do you think? Have you ever done it? Nowadays you do it through social media, but this is an example of sort of encouragement, isn't it? Um, reassures them, yes, reassures them the countries behind them. They're doing the right thing. You're not alone. Um, want you to know that you know I'm on your side 
and it gives so now if you sort of think of Churchill for a moment if you take these two letters they're both giving different outlooks and in a sense he has to decide which of them does he think represents a general view yeah exactly don't uh, don't give in um uh, I mean I know that you've got this you know you've got these great gifts and um um but but don't you don't, don't give an inch you know um it's very important you, you stick to your guns to use a good sort of military analogy there so um you see what I mean when you sort of start with that basic question what is this a lot of the questions that you yourselves raised at the beginning come up very quickly and you find the answers and you find the answers from simply from asking that very very basic question um sometimes it's not clear immediately what a source is particularly when you have as you often do that letters have been printed and put into some sort of collection where not unlike with the exam um paper you know they don't look like their original i mean, I, re I remember the first bit of historical research work i did when i was um, a student and an undergraduate and um I wanted to look at a particular person in, in history called John Adams um, and I went to a library and I took down a book of his correspondence of his letters I remember sort of opening it and I was expecting to see you know letters rather like like this at least typed out and it wasn't like that and I sort of wasn't clear and I remember asking my brain sort of saying what is all this it wasn't clear but once you do work out what it is then a lot of things fall into place so immediately you know we're thinking about constituents we're thinking about ordinary people um when i say ordinary bear in mind not everyone would think to write a letter to their mp not everyone will was be literate enough to write a letter to their mp these two letters are clearly very well written in their different ways um and we as historians have to ask the same question that churchill has to ask though for different reasons to what extent are either of these typical of something wider now i'm going to take you on to um a different example don't worry about that one just briefly though here what you've got is the catalogue explanation from the archive of the box if you sort of think back to that remember those boxes all of those letters the, the the two we looked at and the one i just skipped over would be in this so let me just decode what you're looking at here charles seven blah 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 this is the um catalogue number Sorry, something big fell out, fell down just outside the, the window. Um, this is the catalogue number for the box. So in other words, when you go into that archive, um, that is what you would see written on the box. You take this box down from the shelf, it would have char, char would be for Charwell. Um, box seven, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, it covers the period 11th of September to the 8th of December, 1938. So if you wanted a letter that was written on the 9th of December, you would presumably look for Char 7108. The A and B, incidentally, would suggest that this is in fact two boxes, box A and box B, and that in itself um, gives you an idea of how many letters. Um, and when you consider that this is a matter of uh, September to December, so, you know, and, he, and there are 240 folios, that's the word for a page. Um, and these are simply uh, correspondence from his constituency. That gives an idea of how many letters from his uh, from his constituents he's getting, and that in itself tells you just to what extent people were really were energised about this. Um, it's in other words, we have got an issue every bit as important and as urgent and as divisive to people in 1938 as Brexit was uh, for us more recently, or going back a little bit further, though a bit far for some of you I know, but say the um, the Iraq War. Um, it's the same sort of issue. You get a lot of letters coming in. Then it tells you the sort of things that the letters deal with. So when you get these two boxes, um, these two bound files, and bound files will mean that these letters have actually been put into a fold, two folders. Um, so they're not loose, but you, you can get either. Um, local feeling against appeasement, local feeling against war, the publishing of Mein Kampf in the Times, local disapproval of WSC as Ch Churchill, his criticism of Noble Chamberlain, the inadequacy of local evacuation arrangements and local support for the Spanish Republic. Don't worry about that particular issue if you're not familiar with it. But basically, this is all letters about these foreign policy issues. So they're not writing about, you know, the latest um, uh, road building or an ex extension of uh, building or anything like that. They're not writing about local things. They are writing about national foreign policy issues. This is telling you something. This is telling you something about the nature of, of feeling. And then 
other things that you'll find in the, those boxes, um, cutting from the Sunday Express, presumably um, an article that Churchill thought was important enough to cut out, uh, cutting from the Times, uh, which got an extract from Mein Kampf. I would imagine that someone objecting to uh, the Times uh, publishing an extract from Mein Kampf included it with their letter, I don't know. And uh, so in other words, these are supporting papers relating to some of the topics. So when you go into the archive, <coughs> I mean, obviously you can do this online, but if you were to go into the building, you fill in either a little slip or you, didn't, you do it on, online. And eventually someone goes down into the files, like that girl in the picture, she gets that box, she takes it out physically, brings it up, puts it in front of you on the table, you open the box, you find inside if box, if you've got both boxes, <coughs> you'll find two folders, ring folders, with all of this, um, inside and you start looking through. So you would have found those letters like that. That's what this is. And immediately you see, you begin to um, go beyond just the content of the letter into it much broader historical questions, as I say, about uh, whether it's typical or not, what it's actually showing, what this is good evidence of and so on and so forth. Okay, now I'm going to give you um, uh, an example here of something actually written by Churchill himself. So we look at it, uh, your eye can see that this is in, this has been typed. You look a little bit more closely, you see that it's got sort of various um, bits written on in pen. So it's sort of been edited a bit. Um, so the first question, remember, the first question you ask of a source is, what is it? And in this particular case, um, I can tell you what it is. Um, and in fact, over here in, uh, in this side, you can, you can see because I've sort of put the catalogue um, description over here. Again, it's from uh, one of the files. And this particular thing, because I edited down the other bits in the file, is a press statement by Churchill on the 6th of November 1938, replying to Hitler's attack on him as a warmonger. Source material includes extracts from Hitler's speech. Moreover, this particular one was then published later on in a collection called His Complete Speeches, Volume 6, and you can find it on those pages. And if you look at the page numbers, you can see just how long this book, this uh, collection is. Page, pages 6018 and 6019. So let's just go back a bit. It's a press statement. And you as students would be perfectly um, justified in saying, what is a press statement? Because it's not something I don't suppose you've ever had to deal with, let, let alone actually write. So what do we know from the catalogue? This was written in response to a speech by Hitler. <clears throat> and Hitler criticised Churchill as a warmonger. We're still in the Sudetenland um, crisis of November 1938. So um, Churchill, we know, well, if you don't know, I can tell you, was one of the very few to speak out against the government's line of appeasement. You'll have gathered that from the letter from the constituent, um, and the suggesting that Churchill was just about the only person doing it. So perhaps no great surprise that Hitler um, chooses to criticise Churchill in a speech. Now, we don't have in front of us the speech that Hitler made. However, if you go into the archive, according to the catalogue, you will find it because, not surprisingly, Churchill would have had a copy of it and that was included in the box. So if you had had the box in front of you, you'd find the, the press statement and you would find the speech that it's referring to. OK, but it still doesn't explain what a press statement is. A press statement, uh, again, I can tell you this, um, is... Uh, a well it's a statement it's it's a you you write out essentially your thoughts what it is that you want said and this is the point is it's not it's this isn't like a diary where you write your private thoughts for yourself or a private letter where you write it to someone you know possibly someone you know very well and and uh, you know who knows you very well no this is for publication <clears throat> sometimes the press would simply print the whole thing Sometimes they might only quote part of it. It depends a bit on, on how long it is. This isn't too long. I would imagine the press would print all of this. So you're writing for publication. This is a public statement. You see, what is it? Immediately, your questions begin to be answered. It, this is deliberately written for the press to reproduce. And of course, that would mean the press around the world would pick it up. So this is a public statement of his position. Okay. 
Um, you draft it. Uh, he had secretaries, so um, you know he, he would have. Uh, he tended to dictate to secretaries, so he would have typed this out. Then we picture him reading it. Remember him standing at that desk. That's where he would have done this. So he's got it in front of him. He's got his cigar in his mouth, and um, and at the very beginning it says, "Mr. Churchill." And if you look at it, it's been crossed out, hasn't it? Mr. Churchill said, and he's crossed that out and said, "Issued the following statement." I wonder why. What's the difference? Um, I, it's a, I, I don't know is the quick answer. Neither do you. Neither does anyone. The only person who could tell us why he changed it would be Churchill himself, and he died in 1965. So what do we do, my friends? We use our historical imagination. Yes, you are allowed to do that. Um, we get into sort of Churchill's mind, you have some sort of knowledge of the man. Why would he not be satisfied with Mr. Churchill said and change it to issue the following statement? And I can, I'll tell you what I reckon at any rate, and it is only what I reckon, but said is okay, but it's, a, you know, it's nothing special issued a statement important people issue statements governments issue statements monarchs issue statements so by saying mr churchill issued the following statement <clears throat> i reckon that essentially what he's doing is making his statement more important i can't prove it i don't know it for certain but that's my reading of it or if you like that's my analysis that's my interpretation but notice i'm not making it up out of the blue I'm doing it for my knowledge of Churchill and my more general knowledge of how people issue statements. OK, then it says, I am surprised that the head of a great state, that's Germany, of course, should set himself to attack British members of parliament who hold no official position and who are not even leaders of parties. Such action on his part can only enhance any influence they may have because their fellow countrymen have long been able to form their own opinion about them and really do not need foreign guidance. Now, this is nice. What he's saying is, Mr. H you know, Herr Hitler's um, <clears throat> statement surprised me. And of course, what he's, he's also saying is that this makes me sound even more important. He's, he's scoring points. This is no great surprise, because this is a sort of duel between Hitler and, and, uh, and Churchill being fought out in the press. Hitler has made a, a speech and, uh, or a, given a statement, I can't remember which it was, um, and Churchill is doing the same. It's, it's a sort of battle between the two of them. Now, he gets into the, uh, the meat of it. Herr Hitler is quite mistaken in supposing that Mr. Eden, Mr. Duff Cooper, myself, and the leaders of the Liberal and Labour parties are warmongers. Not one of us has ever dreamt of an act of aggression against Germany, blah, blah, blah. Okay. In other words, no great surprise. He's saying, no, 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 we're not warmongers. Um, we are standing up for proper principles and blah, blah, blah. But the reason I'm sort of stopping there is because we've now encountered some other names. We've got Mr. Eden, Mr. Duff Cooper, Churchill himself, leaders of the Liberal and Labour parties. <clears throat> Who are these people? And if we're really going to understand this document, we need to know th that. Now, in some cases, um, you might already know. Anthony Eden was uh, a well-known figure. Um, he had been foreign secretary under Chamberlain, but had resigned uh, in protest about appeasement. He goes on later to become prime minister. He's prime minister at the time of the Suez crisis. He's a well-known name. Um, he was foreign secretary for, under Churchill, in fact, during the war. So I, I won't uh, spend time on, on him for a moment because he's OK, we can identify him. Leaders of the Liberal and Labour parties, uh, you either know or you don't. The Labour Party leader was Clement Attlee, uh, a very famous name. So, uh, you know, I, I think he would... Um, so sort of recognize that one quickly. I'm not expecting you to know the leader of the Liberal Party in 1938. Um, and uh, that's the sort of thing where, you know what, and I don't tell anyone, even though this is being recorded, but you can Google it. <clears throat> you could even look up on Wikipedia, you know, leaders of the Liberal Party. Hey, you know what, we all do it. Um, but Duff Cooper, um, who he, and where do you find out? <clears throat> well, um, to go rather above Wikipedia, um, and finding this out, what I've done for you is just to look ahead and where can you look? Now, if it's someone British or at least someone from British history, actually major figures in British history who are not themselves British also feature in here. Um, the, easily the best uh, source is the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, ODNB or Odd Nob as I like to call it. Um, what is this? This is um, a sort of encyclopedia, if you like, um, that's called a dictionary. <coughs> originally written in uh, sort of late Victorian times, um, but more recently massively updated and expanded and put online. 
And because it's such a huge database, you have to subscribe to it. And as you can see over here, um, Angley Ruskin does subscribe. So um, essentially what you do is you go to the uh, search article title, article meaning you know an article about the person, um, and you type in. So you type in Duff Cooper, which I did for you. And what do we find? Um, there we are. We've got, uh, he, is in, he is in there. Um, so, you know, obviously he's an important enough figure. And you start with something fairly basic. There's a, uh, there's a photograph of him. If they have a picture, they like to give you at least one of the person. Cooper Alfred Duff, first Viscount Norwich, though his date, he's a diplomat and politician. There's when he was born. And we have some rather racy stuff about his dad, specialised in the sexual problems of the upper classes, uh, too much information. Okay, so we can find out. And then we look a bit further down in the article. And what do we find? Aha! In autumn 1938, Chamberlain returned from a meeting with Hitler, bearing peace with honour, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is the Sudeten crisis. In Cooper's view, the peace would be only transitory. In other words, it wouldn't last very long. And the dishonour, so gross that he could not bear to be associated with it. On the 3rd of October, he denounced the Munich Agreement to the House of Commons and resigned from the government. OK, now you see, we can understand why he would have been included in Hitler's speech denouncing Churchill and why Duff Cooper would have been in there, um, you know, being denounced as a warmonger. But we don't, we can't get that from the source alone. You need to look for something else in order to tell you, um, um, you know, who he is. But there are plenty of good um, sources. Of course, an important thing to ask here is, wait a minute, who wrote this? Uh, after all, this is not, uh, this is an interpretation. This is, if you look at it, it's like sort of like an, an essay about the man. But if we just go back to the beginning of the article in the previous slide, it does tell us Cooper, Alfred Duffer, so I count Norris, uh, blah, 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 Philip Ziegler. Philip Ziegler, very well-known historian, he's the one who wrote that essay. And indeed, there were hundreds of people who wrote the essays for the um, Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. But they are essays about them. They are, of course, people's interpretation. It's This is not the facts. This is this shouldn't be regarded as it must be true. It's in the ODNB, and that's why, incidentally, you know they do tell you who wrote these articles because you might say, well, Ziegler says this in the ODNB, but I think, or oh, I found something else, and um, so you know it's it's a point of view as much as anyone else's. Um, so if we just go back briefly to the um, to the source. Okay, so we've now found out um, who these people are, and clearly what we've got is Churchill's defiant message back to Hitler. Um, and you can see how he has refined it, how he's got the wording. Churchill was very, very good with words, very good at choosing just the right words, strengthening, he took enormous care. And in fact, you can see the care that he took because um, you know he's gone over this, he's made alterations. Look at this down here. The original version has, I have always said that if Great Britain were defeated in war, I hope we should find a Hitler uh, to lead them back to their rightful position among the nations. And he's changed it to, I have always said that if Great Britain were defeated in war, I hope we should find a Hitler to lead us back to our rightful position among the nations. In other words, he's saying, I, I've got nothing personal against Hitler, great man in many ways, but um, there's an interesting line of argument, not something, of course, you would say later. We're running out of, we're coming, you know, we're running into the last section and I want to just leap ahead to uh, another example. Um, and this takes us into a different topic, though also related to, um, to the war, of course, and this is the Holocaust. Um, and this is, again, well, look at it. First question, of course, what is it? It's typed, it's marked private. Um, and if you look at the typing, you can see <clears throat> that the typeface is slightly different between the My Dear Henry and Edith the 13 at the top and your sincerely Winston S. Churchill and the rest of it. Don't worry about why for the moment, but don't forget it. We'll come back to that in a moment. Next thing to look at it is if you look at the actual um, quality of the typeface, I don't know. And I can't tell from the online version. This is where you would need to see the original. But I think this is probably one of those copies I was talking about, i.e. the letter would have gone to this chap, Henry, and 
when you type it, when you, what you enter into the typewriter is both the sheet of paper you're going to type on and will put in the post, and this thing called carbon paper, carbon copy, <clears throat> which enables you to keep a copy of letters that you sent out from your office. And I think by the look of it, this, this has all the hallmarks of a carbon copy. So the original letter, if you wanted to see it, would presumably be with the Lord Melchett. Um, it's marked private, so it's not an official letter, although it is about policy. And if you want to, it says, my dear Henry, and then at the bottom it says the Lord Melchett. Now, the Lord is the correct way to address anyone who is a Lord. But my dear Henry suggests, I, I would have thought that um, he's quite a good friend, but he knows him quite well. And it's very often the way um, that when... Uh, sort of rather more official letters. This would be would have been sent, it's 1944, this would have been sent from his um, office at, at 10 Downing Street, that you have a secretary who types the main part of the letter, but the beginning and the end, the sort of dear and the signing off, um, is left for the, um, you know, in this case for Churchill, to do himself. Sometimes it's handwritten, you sometimes see that, that the main part of the, of the letter is typed or nowadays word processed, and the uh, the dear and the bottom bit at the bottom, because after all, that's where you can get more personal. Um, you know, my dear Henry is quite a uh, a personal way. Um, and if you think your sincerely Winston S. Churchill sounds a bit formal, there's a difference in the time. Um, it wasn't quite as it wasn't necessarily quite as formal. You even actually believe it or not, and you might not believe it, get sort of letters between fathers and sons signed off in that way. It's, it's just a difference in, in style of time. OK, let's have a quick look. First, no, that's what it is. So it's a letter from church. It's a person. It's a private letter from Churchill as prime minister. So it's a sort of semi official. Not, and, well, it's not an official letter, but it's sort of from him uh, in, in office. So it's not quite the same as, a, as an MP's letter. And the obvious thing, same as with Duff Cooper, is who is Lord Melchett? Never heard of him. Um, well, we look ahead. I did a little bit of looking up uh, for you. He's from the Mond family. His title was Lord Melchett. If you look here, down here, here are the members of the family. Um, his, his father was Alfred, first Baron Melchett, and that's the chap we're looking at, Henry, second Baron Melchett. Mond, look at the names, Ludwig, Robert Ludwig, Alfred Moritz Mond, Henry Ludwig, Julian Edward Alfred Mond. This is a German, originally German immigrants, and indeed a German Jewish family. So we begin to see why he would have written to Churchill. And again, you see, aha, right. Um, someone who was uh, of German Jewish origins would unquestionably feel particularly urgently about the reports coming out from Europe about the, uh, uh, the treatment of the Jews. And just to put you into context a little bit here, and this is something, you know, okay, I know you, you'd have to look up. Um, by 1944, just about all the Jewish populations of Europe had been um, largely rounded up by the Germans, with one major exception, which was the Jews of Hungary, who had been protected by their government. And uh, then the Germans went, went into Hungary, and in 1944, that was the last major Jewish population, um, and there was a, a real uh, attempt to try to do something to save them from, uh, from being shipped off to Auschwitz. So this is what this is about. And he says, you wrote to me on the 1st of July about the German plans for the massacre of the Hungarian Jews. So you'd need to look back in the files and find a letter from Lord Melchett dated the 1st of July about this. And here he is writing a, a fortnight later. That doesn't mean to say that he wasn't being dilatory about it. He says, I forwarded your letter to the Foreign Secretary. So we must imagine that it arrives, he sent it to the Foreign Office, waits for a reply, gets it back, and then writes back to Lord Melchett. Now you see how that could easily fill the time. And fear that I can add nothing to the statement he made in the House on the 5th of July in replying to Silverman's question. So, um, clearly, um, the Foreign Secretary made a statement in the House of Commons on the 5th of July about this in response to a question by someone called Silverman. Uh, Silverman is indeed a Jewish name. The MP was a Jewish MP called Sidney Silverman. You might say uh, it would be quite useful to know what that statement was, and indeed it would. So how can we find that out? And the answer is we go beyond the ODNB. And what have we got here? We have Hansard, which is the um, official record of debates in Parliament available online. And here it is. I, again, I looked it up. There it is, 5th of July, 1944. Um, you go down the list of topics, and there it was about uh, Jews in Hungary. There's the, the letter. Uh, sorry, beg your There's the questions from Mr. Sid Silverman. Um, asked the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs whether he had any information as to the mass deportation of Jews now proceeding from Hungary to Poland for the purpose of massacre. And Mr Eden, we've already identified, was the Foreign Secretary. So that 
is what he's referring to there. Now, I'm going to bring this to a, a, a close now because what I've tried to show you, I hope, is that uh, first of all, the real sources in the archives are significantly different from the sort of things you have to deal with at A level. But nevertheless, the most important question to ask of a source, the most, in many ways, the sort of richest question to ask is the simplest. What is this? And I would say to you that that's even more important with the sort of sources that you have to deal with in the form that they appear, in which they appear on your, um, on your exam papers. Secondly, for, you know, in reality, what you, what you would do if you, if you went in an exam room would be to do the sort of checking that I've just shown you. You know, you see names, you can look them up. Uh, in, in uh, you know, the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography or wherever it might be. You see reference to a, a parliamentary debate, you can look it up, you can, you can cross-reference. And this is what allows you to put the source into context. Remember, is this typical or is this a one-off? That is the second most important question that you ask. And in fact, in many ways, it's if what is this is the first question, then is this typical of anything? is the final question and all the questions that you've raised are the ones that lead from one to the other so what is it question provenance uh, purpose and so on and so forth blah 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 and then down to is this typical and if so of what and that is what will give you the sources value and use as historical evidence okay i'm going to stop talking there um so just a few minutes if you've got any questions that you want to ask and incidentally, if, you, if there isn't time, you're very, very welcome to email me any questions that, that might occur to you later. This is where he talks. Actually, while you're talking, or while you're thinking of anything to ask, I've got to tell you this. I was a source once on an exam paper. I found myself, I had no idea, I was looking at this exam paper and I suddenly saw source D. I thought, wait a minute, I know that. I wrote that. And it was, it was from a, uh, a textbook I'd written and they'd quoted it as source D. And I mentioned it to my daughter and she looked horrified because she was taking A-level history that year. And she said, uh, if you are a source on my A-level paper, I shall say you're the most unreliable source I've ever known. <laughs> um, Right, the internet age, huge impact. Indeed, it's already have, having it because, in fact, this pandemic has been a very good example because uh, archives have um, allowed the access to their, to their holdings and they've tried to put a lot more online. And clearly that process of putting stuff online will continue. But there, there are times when you do need to see the original so that it should never be a, a sort of reason for sort of getting rid of the originals there will always be a time when you you need to see we fix um you know you, you need to see as i say the back of the document um nelson's battle plan for trafalgar was found was once found on the back of a almost on the back of an envelope um so that was uh, that was from uh ava um and did i Get 100% on the test. Um, uh, depends which test you mean, Ava. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, I don't. I, I doubt it actually. I tend to, very few people ever get 100% except on on quizzes. Um, the thing with with sources is keep calm. Always remind yourself. Picture who originally wrote it. Uh, picture the pen. Literally, I mean, close your minds. Uh, gosh, close your eyes, sorry. Close your eyes and picture that pen on the paper, the typewriter, the fingers of, of, of the type, you know, picture the way in which that source was originally produced. I guess from Lucy. Oh, oh, thank you. Um, right, saying, oh, that's very kind of you. Would I take the same approach for the work of historians rather than primary sources? And in your work as a historian, to what extent do you do this type of approach analysis in day-to-day -day work? Um, the first thing is say, yes, absolutely. Um, um, the, oh, see, yeah. Uh, I, I, Ava, I wasn't having to do the exam, I just found it uh, in a collection. Um, yes, because historians, of course, are people like anyone else. You might not believe it, but, but we are. And certainly historians, when they look at um, written, things written by historians, particularly if they're some time ago, they put that into context as well, because the writing of history also reflects its time. At the moment, there's a huge amount of history uh, around the area of um, civil rights and uh, uh, the you know, relations between different people of different races and ethnic groups and what have you. Uh, there's a lot of interest in 
what's called sensory history, history of, of the senses, smell, uh, and it's got a co colleague, Will Tullett, um, who's been on this History Fest this week, talking about that. Now, why? The answer is because those are things which we as a society are increasingly interested in. So history reflects that. Later on, historians looking back at the early 21st century will look on historical work done now as evidence of our, our period. So yeah, absolutely right, it's the, it's the same. Um, and as for that analysis, you bet, um, uh, you, you, we certainly do. Um, I'll give you one very specific example. I, was use, I mentioned Queen Victoria. I was using her diary once as some research and uh, it was very easy to read. Um, and I was taking various things and getting various ideas. And I hadn't realized that her diary, which was in handwriting, and it was, I was in Windsor Castle, it was in the Royal Archives, and uh, it was the Royal Archivist who said, and of course you do realize that's not the original. Hey, okay, what? The original was destroyed by her daughter. Her daughter took the original, transcribed it all in her much, easy, much uh, better handwriting, and then as she went along, she burnt all the original, you know, page by page as she transcribed it. Now, there's a classic example, because you think, well, how good is, this trans is the transcription? We've no way of knowing, we don't have the original. So you have to do a bit of sort of um, guesswork and um, historical imagination, if you like, to think, would she have um, distorted anything? Would she have hidden anything? Can we believe that? And so on. So you have to buy all of these questions to a very real, and actually, of course, quite a, a prominent source, Queen Victoria's diary. So these things come up all the time. They're not just uh, occasional things that you sort of have to do for A-level. You'd be surprised how often this sort of source analysis, you do have to weigh yourself and say, where does the probability lie? And what is this typical of? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, and thank you very much to all of you for joining us. And I've just popped a couple of links in the chat there about our other sessions tomorrow and also our forthcoming open days if you'd like to find out a bit more. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Bye.